I've been asked to talk to you a little bit about apologetics and um, particularly how apologetics focuses on a doctrine of scripture because that's one of the things that makes our apologetic approach here unique. In case you don't know, my name's Scott Oliphant and I teach apologetics and uh, systematic theology here. Um, a couple of things to say on apologetics and particularly as it relates to theology and uh, at this point uh, prolegomena which is doctrine of scripture. The first thing is um, you may have heard of Cornelius Van Til. He, he was the initial um, apologetics professor here. And when coming here, when Machen asked him to come here, one of the things that Machen wanted that Van Til did is he began to develop his apologetic approach along the lines of Reformed theology. That is, based on Reformed theology then, what are the apologetic implications of that theology and how does that work itself out in terms of the defense of the Christian faith? So that's what Van Til worked on all his life, and uh, it's been called kind of generically presuppositionalism, bad term, doesn't say much. There's a lot of presuppositional types around, and especially in a, our kind of postmodern context, presuppositions mean anything and everything. So it's a bad word. I, I like uh, covenantal because I think it expresses a theological commitment as well as a, a reform context in which apologetics is done. What does that mean uh, fundamentally? What it means is the only way that we know who God is and what he's like and what he wants of us is by him condescending to us to reveal himself. That's what I mean by covenant. God condescends and establishes a relationship with his creation and specifically with his people. Now if you think about um, our, our common theological term for anthropology which is man is the image of God. If you think about image of God terminology in terms of a mirror image, when you're in front of a mirror, your image is there and you say, there I am. Well, of course, that's not you. That's a reflection of you. That's what the mirror is there for. But the image is there because you are there. Think about that in terms of a covenant theology. The reason you are who you are is because God is who he is. And to the extent that you reflect who God is, to that extent, you're fully human. So that's what image language is, part of what image language is meant to mean in, in Scripture. You know, people have said, you know, that the declaration in Genesis, man is the image of God, but then it doesn't define what that is. Well, all of Scripture defines what that is. You, you, you begin to look at that uh, in terms of what all, uh, all of the Bible says, and if you can boil that down fundamentally, it is that every person from the beginning of creation into eternity is related to God. Now that relationship has one of two characteristics since Genesis 3. It's either relationship that is grounded and founded on the grace of God or it's grounded and founded on the wrath of God. But see, even being in a relationship that is designated as one that is wrathful, even there there's a relationship. It's not a happy one. But every person is related to God, either by grace in Christ or wrath in Adam. Now, the only way you can know that sort of thing, the only way you can begin to understand that is if God comes down to reveal himself to us. And he does that, uh, the way we put it theologically, two different modes by way of creation and by way of special revelation, which tends to be verbal re revelation. Those two have always been present. God reveals himself in creation and has always done that, as Paul says in Romans 1. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. So this has been the case since the creation of the world. God's revealed himself in creation. You see aspects of who God is. You see his attributes displayed in all of creation. The heavens declare the glory of God, the psalmist says. But you also see that God um, designates how we are to be obedient to him to put it another way, how we're to please him, he designates that by way of verbal revelation. So that even in the garden, God says, be fruitful and multiply, subdue the earth. And then he says, do not eat from this tree. Now all of that is special revelation. Adam and Eve wouldn't have known that as a way of obeying God apart from God's special communication to them. Now what does all this mean apologetically? Well. It means a number of things, but one of the things that it means is that our authority, and we know this as Christians, but we forget it sometimes in apologetics, our authority always has to be 
the revelation of God. That's where we stand as Christians. And this has what we call in apologetics epistemological implications, implications with respect to how we know anything. Not only God, but how we know creation itself, how we know ourselves. Remember, um, beginning of Calvin's Institutes, uh, what is it that designates true wisdom or true knowledge? It's knowledge of God, knowledge of self. And Calvin says, I'm not even sure which comes first because we're just always back and forth. But what he's saying is to know ourselves truly, we have to know God truly. To know God truly, we have to know who we are. We are creatures fundamentally. We don't know that unless we know there is a creator. Once we say there's a creator, we automatically then come back to being creatures. Uh, we know ourselves as sinful. What does that mean? It means before the face of a holy God, we have violated his character and his command. So this is what Calvin is saying. Knowledge has its uh, source and its root only in God's revelation. And that's true as well in apologetics. Now this is where it gets a little bit dicey in the history of apologetics because in the history of apologetics, part of what's been um, articulated and taught and argued is that when you approach uh, someone who's not a Christian and, you, and they're, let's say, asking you a question about Christianity or you want to talk to them, you want to defend the faith of them, what has been said historically is that you start with them in some, some sort of neutral uh, territory, neutral ground, whether that's reason in a kind of, in a more sort of rationalistic apologetic, or maybe it's evidence in a kind of empirical approach to apologetic. But whatever it is, you start in a, in a neutral place. We all reason the same way, someone would say. Here's one apologist said, let's start with the basic rational law of thought that everything that comes to be has a cause. All right, what's he saying at that point? He's saying, we all agree, not only that this is the case, but we agree on the meaning of what we're saying here, that everything comes to be has a cause. Now, without going into all history of, of the problems there, I think one of the things you begin to see is if you start there with that as your basic premise, that is the neutrality of reason, you have no way legitimately to bring in another authority that grounds that reasoning process. That becomes the problem. So that um, in, one, in one dialogue, it was an actual dialogue that I, I'm familiar with, this person who said everything comes to be as a cause, let's start there, said that to the atheist, and the atheist said, okay, that's great. And then, as you, you know how it goes, um, everything comes to be as a cause. God didn't come to be. The universe came to be. God didn't come to be, so God must be the cause of the universe. And this atheist kept saying, yeah, but how do you know God didn't come to be? And this person would say, because everything comes to be as a cause.